All right, so I have 102 and we have a packed agenda, so we are going to get started. Uh, for those of you that I don't know personally, as it says right there, my name is Adam Pearl. Uh, I'm the president and CEO of Art Pride New Jersey. We are so grateful that you could be with us this morning for our webinar. We have a ton of great information across the board. Uh, I think most folks have been used to a webinar, but if for some reason this is your first uh, webinar, first webinar with us, uh, we encourage you to use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen to submit questions, uh, whether they be for any of our speakers, and we'll take a few breaks along the way today to answer different questions for the different sections of information. Um, also, keep an eye on that chat uh, box as well. We will, from time to time, put a URL or some information in there. Um, and then we do have at least one or two polls today, so you're more than likely to see a poll pop up on your screen. Uh, when that happens, uh, please respond. Uh, in real time certainly helps us uh, as we move along. I do wanna share with everyone uh, that as always, we are recording this webinar. Um, so uh, if you miss something, it will be up on our website, usually later today. Uh, you can always go back, take a look and get that piece of information. Um, and without any further ado, I am going to introduce Anne Marie Miller, our prize director of advocacy and public policy to give us an arts advocacy update. Over to you, Anne Marie. Hi, everybody. Hi, Adam. Um, uh, thanks, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, all right, thanks. I didn't even have to ask for the first slide. Um, we just want to no back, please. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> um, uh, the very first thing um, in order of business today is to just let you know that there is a New Jersey chapter of the Independent Venue Association. So it's NJ, uh, NJ EVA, um, as, and that is part of NEVA, National um, Independent Venue Association. Um, Sarah Scully from Hoboken, Hoboken, oh, sorry, Hopewell Theater um, has been working hard to gather New Jersey folks um, who are uh, running independent venues throughout the state to um, come together um, as especially now before, while we await a second um, uh, stimulus package, um, hoping that there is a provision within that for independent venues. So the link is there at the top um, to go to their website and join up. Uh, next slide. So on um, the, it, within the COVID resource page uh, at the Art Pride website, uh, there is now um, a One Jersey Pledge uh, with Keep Jersey Arts Alive logo together. It's basically the preliminary information, um, the standards by which you will be keeping your workspace and uh, venue spaces safe to the public. Um, so we ask you to, to uh, check this out. Um, I think we're going to be setting up um, a separate page where, as you pledge, we'll know who has actually done this. Um, but in in uh, we'll put the link in the and yeah, it's, it's the New Jersey. Uh, we'll put that link in the in the um, in the chat box. Um, and don't forget, you can check this webinar out um, online later on today, and all the links will be there as well. Um, so we're happy to do this. We're happy to feature these. Uh, preliminary standards as we work all work towards safe workplaces and safe um, arts venues. Uh, next slide, please. Um, okay, so this week, um, the state of New Jersey, and the link is there as well, um, is for a, a, a brand new business survey to help with the state recovery strategy. It would be really important for arts groups and individual artists um, that are operating uh, independently as gig workers, et cetera, uh, to please complete the survey. Um, this is, a, you know, it's, it's in conjunction with Rutgers University and um, there is, an, uh, you know, an opportunity for us to be featured there. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Um, as we approach, um, December. It's hard to believe that we're approaching December, but December 1st, um, the Zimmerly Museum is doing an art before and after hours um, in memory of their executive director who passed away earlier 
this year. Um, for people who remember, usually December 1st is a day without art um, in honor of all of the folks who have passed away from AIDS over the years. Um, this, cel this celebration of Tom Soklowski's life uh, will be part of that day as well. So um, the, the link is there, uh, visit go.rutgers.edu slash December one to participate in the celebration of Tom's life. Next slide, please. So the State Arts Council, if you didn't see this information or you somehow missed it, um, has announced the COVID relief grants for New Jersey artists. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we highlighted this so that folks can, um, the deadline to apply is December 15th. Um, I, I believe there's $500,000 um, set aside for grants of $5,000 each to individual artists throughout New Jersey. The link is there um, and for that as well. Um, next slide, please. And all the state information, state's really busy and working hard in so many different ways. Um, there was a webinar earlier um, this week um, with, with the um, Allison Tratner and um, Abby Colbert who are heading up the New Jersey Arts and Culture Recovery Working Group. Um, and along with the New Jersey Economic Development Authority, um, provided information on phase two grants that are specific for subsidies for PPE to small businesses and organizations. So um, discounts are available, but look at the timeline. Um, they expire November 30th. So if you're interested, um, next slide, please. Um, if you're interested, go to that, um, to that URL, you know, as soon as possible and you will see recommended vendors for PPE supplies and how you can get those uh, discounts. Um, there, they also mentioned that the count, several counties are offering uh, opportunities through CARES funding in Middlesex County, um, Burlington County, and Hudson County, um, specifically in Hudson County in Jersey City, um, to obtain um, some of the CARES relief for arts organizations. So um, you want to check that out. Um, I believe if you participated in the webinar, you were gonna get the slide deck for this. I haven't gotten it yet, but you might, that might be coming out today. And if it does, uh, we'll be sure to share the whole slide deck. Uh, next slide, please. So um, yeah, post-election, it feels like it was ages ago and um, it wasn't. <laughs> and there's a post-election webinar on uh, Monday at three o'clock that Americans for the Arts is hosting with all of their, um, with their lobbyists and their um, federal legislative directors. Um, the um, Earl there is at the bottom to, to sign up, it's free. Um, and um, they will provide some information in terms of uh, what's happening and how, how the election really affects the arts in the long, short and long term. Um, next slide, please. Well, last thing sort of came up on the radar screen yesterday um, is that downtown New Jersey uh, is offering placemaking awards. Uh, and they have, uh, there's a deadline of December 18th to nominate um, a project, uh, perhaps in your neighborhood that um, is an exemplary creative placemaking project. So this is an opportunity for you to um, get that information out there. Uh, next slide. I think that's it. That's it from me. Hey, Marie, what can I tell you? Hey. No question. Yay. <laughs> Everybody have a really good holiday weekend. Um, peace out. <laughs> Don't go too far, Amory, because if someone has a question later on, I might bring it back. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate the continued updates, Amory. And uh, now I'm gonna introduce, I think you might be able to see him on our screen. Uh, most of you know, hopefully know, if you don't know, Jim Atkinson, who's our Pride's Director of Programs and Services. Uh, and uh, Jim, along with the, the team, oversees uh, the amazing Discover Jersey Arts. Um, and, and with Anne Marie, oversees our Keep Jersey Arts Alive amongst many, many other responsibilities. 
to make sure that our pride is uh, continuing to operate every day. So I'm going to throw it over to Jim and his team. Jim, thank you very much. Thanks, Adam. And uh, it's great to see everybody today. So we wanted to take this opportunity to provide an update as to what uh, our pride and our partners over at the State Arts Council are doing around Discover Jersey Arts, because Obviously, we haven't talked about this program a whole lot in the recent months uh, because of COVID, but there is definitely some activity happening and some ac uh, additional activity uh, being planned. So we wanted to take a few moments and let everybody know what we've been up to. So uh, first of all, when we look at our goals right now, um, as many of you are aware, we have been promoting your virtual events under the Jersey Arts at Home brand uh, since last like April, May. And we are continuing to do that and uh, will continue to do that uh, until events are able to resume on a large scale and uh, sustainable level. Uh, in the meantime, there are some venues that have been doing live in-person events and we are promoting those as well uh, through a, a page on our website as well as through uh, email and our social media channels. So that is all still happening. We are also continuing to create and publish uh, journalistic content that we do with feature stories and podcasts and video segments. Uh, certainly the quantity of that has gone down a bit since these were primarily being envisioned to be uh, preview stories. So we're not doing quite as many of them as we had been doing pre-COVID, uh, but we are still doing them. And uh, some of their content has shifted a bit. We're doing some more uh, artist profiles and personality stories. Uh, but we are also, of course, uh, using them as a way to promote the, the uh, the virtual events that you're doing. So all of that is still happening. Uh, the scale of it is, is shifted a bit with COVID, but it is still continuing. And we wanted to make sure you all knew uh, that we were continuing to do that. Uh, for anyone who's visited jerseyarts.com in the past six or seven or eight months or so may have noticed that it looks quite different. Uh, the reason being that the legacy site that we, we were using for jerseyarts.com really didn't have any capability to do the kind of things we wanted it to be doing in a COVID environment. So uh, we kind of shut that site down and we very quickly, thanks to, uh, to Emily and Corey on the, on the RPRI team, uh, worked really feverishly to, to get a temporary site launched, uh, which is what we're using right now as the jerseyarch.com site. And as you can see, this is where we're promoting the at home, the virtual events, these change all the time. Uh, Emily Ambash on the RPRI team does a really good job of, of mixing the content up and changing the events around so that they're not stagnant. You don't always see the same ones on the website. Uh, as we mentioned, you know, this is also where under the Culture Vultures brand, which is kind of our online magazine, where we're continuing to push, uh, to push that feature content, those podcasts and those video stories. So that is all still happening. Uh, and as, as we said, there is a landing page on the site that we are using uh, to promote venues. Now, we're not actually promoting live events, uh, or I should say in-person events right now. Uh, we're promoting venues that are offering in-person events because they are so volatile and they change so quickly and there's no automated system behind the site to, to, to handle that kind of content. So uh, what we're doing is things like you see here, you know, the more the MPAC is offering several live performances again with healthy safety restrictions and learn more, we'll click over to MPAC site. So that's how we're handling the in-person events right now. And uh, frankly, we'll be handling it that way, at least in the immediate future. You may be asking yourself, um, you know, how do I get my content featured? Uh, so there's a page on the Art Pride site, as you see here, it's artpridenj.org slash jersey hyphen arts hyphen content. Um, that's where you can kind of see a, an explanation about how do I submit an event to be featured for virtual? How do I let them know that my venue is doing live performances? How do I pitch a story uh, for a podcast? All that's outlined on this page. So you can see all that information uh, readily right, right on this URL here. And uh, maybe I'll ask uh, Vince if you could drop that into the, into the chat to help folks uh, know exactly where to find that. So there are some other goals coming up, uh, short and long-term, even though long-term for us now is redefined, right? Because who's thinking much beyond a year or so. Uh, but we do intend in 2021 to get back to the redesign of the jerseyarch.com site. That was something that had been slated for 2020, but COVID reared its ugly head and uh, threw that for a loop. So we are gonna get back to that. Uh, there's a lot of work that's been done on the research side of that, but we wanna get into you know, a, a production phase in, in early in, in 2021. Um, in the meantime, what we're doing right now is we are preparing uh, two different campaigns actually to help promote the reopening of arts venues when that time comes in 2021. So obviously right now, 
is not the time to talk about arts necessarily being fully open for audiences, uh, but that time will get here, although it seems like it'll never get here, but there will be a day uh, at some point when uh, well, we're kind of loosely determining a critical mass of organizations are opened in a sustained way for a sustained period of time. And we want to have a campaign ready to go to promote that messaging uh, to the public. And there's already a task force involved in help, uh, helping us with the messaging and the creative direction for that. And uh, we're looking at, you know, how we'll replicate some deliverables online as well. So that is all in process now. So when the time comes, we'll be able to activate it really quickly. Uh, at that time, we'll also be looking for ways to re-engage our member base of nearly 50,000 patrons that are Jersey Arts members. And we'll want to reinvigorate that member base, again, when you're ready to start, you know, that kind of uh, return to whatever normal is in 2021. But also in the meantime, we do work to provide programs to aid organizations and helping you understand existing audiences and help you build new audiences. And that is something we're continuing to do. And one of the cornerstones programs that we have for that is the Audience Insights Manager. Uh, so AIM is a community patron database uh, that right now about 40 organizations subscribe to and they pull their data collectively. And what that has resulted in is a, uh, a single database of nearly 2 million unique households of qualified cultural consumers. So. We say they're qualified because the only way they get in the database is if they're uh, uh, buying a ticket or attending an arts event from one of those 40 current participating groups. So it's a powerful tool. Um, typically, we talk about how um, it's a great tool for growing your audience and for better targeting your own marketing initiatives to your existing audience. But uh, right now, we also want to mention it does more than that. In the COVID era, one of the more underutilized tools within AIM is its ability to help you pull your existing audience and look for donors uh, based on their habits, based on their demographics and psychographic data that AIM will give you that you wouldn't have otherwise. So uh, that's it's an underutilized area. And again, in the, in the COVID era that we're living in, that's an area where existing or new subscribers to AIM might want to spend a little time. Um, for those organizations that are working on uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, within their organization and looking at ways to diversify audiences, uh, AIM will give you information on your existing audiences, demographic information on them that will help you set benchmarks. So if you're looking at we want to increase our the diversification of our audience, it's good to know where you are today so you can go back and measure that one year, two year, five years out. And AIM will just do that for you. There's no, I mean, you, you don't have to undertake that work. AIM will take care of that for you. I mean, and of course, if we're all writing grants, it's a reminder that AIM also helps you provide really accurate audience demographics to your funders. So you don't have to do guesswork or, uh, you know, do kind of get, I've seen really interesting ways that people like to try to gauge the demographic um, profile of their audiences. This is not a guesswork. This is, this is real hard data. So AIM provides that. Um, it also does a few things that people don't normally think of in that it helps them develop programming. I mean, we've seen some instances out in the field where groups misunderstood who their audiences were. So we're able to tweak their programming a little bit to help better serve their patrons. And that's a great thing uh, to, to undertake. It's also, so it's kind of like a myth busting tool. Um, another thing that really didn't come up until really recently was it creates a secure offsite disaster recovery backup of your entire patron database. If you're if your patron database were to crash or become compromised in any way, and you're really fully embracing AIM and keeping your data updated there, you can just export it back out again. Uh, so you kind of get that as a free added service. Um, and last but not least, it contributes uh, aggregate census data. So if we want to look at what does an arts patron in New Jersey look like as far as their demographics or their psychographics or their buying behaviors, uh, what's, you know, what's a typical income range, that kind of information, uh, we can now garner that on a, a kind of an aggregate level uh, by looking at those 2 million households. And 2 million households is a lot, but we think it could be even bigger. If there was more participation in AIM, we would obviously love to see uh, a more diverse group of organizations participating and give us even better aggregate census data. But it's, it's worth mentioning that that is another uh, value add to AIM uh, for the community at large. So we're lucky today to have uh, two folks with us from TRG Arts, which is our partner uh, in, they actually manage AIM through what uh, they, their service called Data Center. And we have Hannah and Adam here, and I am happy to 
to hand it off and let them talk a little bit more about uh, what they're doing with their community patron, uh, their community patron database network, and some of the other things that are coming on the horizon. So, Jim, before you before we hand it off to Adam and Hannah, yeah. just one quick question that came up, um, and and Amory, there's one for you, but we'll we'll take that at the end so we can get Adam and Hannah and keep flowing here. Uh, Karen Pinzolo would wants to know, can I submit info to Jersey Arts if I'm not a member? I guess not a member of Art Pride. Submit events for jerseyarts.com? Yes. Yeah, so yes, you absolutely can. So uh, the Jersey Arts Marketers Network is um, a collaboration of about 280-ish groups that are uh, any direct grantees of the Arts Council, uh, any member organizations of Art Pride or any member organizations of the Theater Alliance. That's typically the criteria we use. Although I will say that, again, because it's COVID, We've been a little less strict about that. So if you have an interesting event and you send it, you know, we've been pretty loose about um, about that kind of criteria. But that's typically who you would you have to be kind of part of that network to to take advantage of that. But right now, again, we're we're being pretty loose about it. And I will I will add in too that uh, we mentioned this at our annual meeting um, that uh, Art Pride is actually launching a free membership program for arts organizations in New Jersey that have not been members of Art Pride before. Um, I know our team is just putting together the collateral so we can spread that information clearly out. Uh, but if you're, you're chomping on the bit, you want to be a member, you've never been a member of Art Pride before, please reach out to myself or, or Megan on our membership team um, and we can talk to you about that too. All right, so back to Han and Adam. Sorry for that uh, tangent. You're all good. Uh, Jim, I think I can take it from here. Uh, thank you for that intro. Um, I have just a couple of updates and resources about how TRG as a, as a firm serving this field is here to help you during this pandemic. And then I'm gonna pass it off to Hannah who will give you a, a demonstration of how data center and AIM can help you all thrive during this pandemic. Uh, so if you wanna advance uh, for me to the next slide. Um, the first admin update I've got, if you haven't signed up for TRG 30, which is our uh, weekly 30 minute webinar, uh, it features our CEO, Jill Robinson. You should all sign up for this uh, as uh, folks who seem to like those lunchtime uh, uh, webinars every Wednesday at noon Eastern. Jill leads a 30 minute discussion uh, that uh, features experts from arts and culture as well as uh, beyond our industry um, to discuss how to thrive during this crisis as organizations in this field that's been obviously so challenged by this crisis, as well as uh, to thrive as professional individuals. We've had guests in past episodes uh, and voices from around the field that include Oscar Eustace, the Artistic Director of the Public Theater in New York, Ben Cameron from the Jerome Foundation, Joseph Hodge from the Guthrie Theater, uh, and even the team, the artistic and uh, executive team at Shakespeare's Globe in London, um, and much, much more. Uh, every week, Jill engages these guests in conversations about how, what they're doing to tackle the myriad of challenges that are presented by this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and you'll also occasionally get insights from TRG about what we're seeing work across the field, uh, as well as a perspective on how to find success during and plan for success after this crisis is all passed. So, uh, you can register as well as find all of the backlog of our past episodes on our website uh, at trgarts.com backslash trg-30. I think we're going to put that uh, link in the chat, but it's easy to find from our homepage as well. Um, so that's one update and resource that we're providing to the field for free that I wanted to make sure you were aware of. Um, you can head to the next slide. Um, we also are providing a uh, a resource that's free and available to everybody in the field during the pandemic, which is our COVID-19 sector benchmark. We've developed this in alliance with a company called Purple7, who uh, provides data insights, uh, business intelligence in the UK. Um, and so during this COVID-19 uh, crisis, we've partnered with them to develop uh, this sector benchmark with support and partnership from the NEA and SMU Data Arts. This is a free, 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 I'm going to say it 950 times, a free benchmark and tool for any arts and cultural organization in North America to join that will provide you with analysis and most importantly, comparison to more than 400 participating organizations across the US, Canada, the UK, North Ireland. Uh, and that 400 organizations includes 11 
here in the state of New Jersey. So we know there's more than 11 of you on the call. So that means we're not quite at full participation here on this webinar. Um, this tool uh, sets you up with a daily data feed out of your CRM uh, and provides real-time daily insights to benchmark your organization's earned and contributed revenues against the industry at large, as well as provide you personalized insights on what kind of customers are still buying, donating, and supporting your organization. Uh, so there's lots of benefit to individual members of this, uh, of this benchmark as you get to compare your data up against uh, our larger uh, benchmark. We're also aggregating this data together to provide large samples of what the landscape looks like for policymakers. In the UK, their national government is using this to inform decisions about how to support uh, live performing arts and culture. Um, we're also working with the NEA and policymakers here in America um, to, to provide facts and figures about the national level about how hard we've, been, we've all been hit. So um, that's another really uh, important thing that you're contributing to. So again, you'll get personalized insights about your data and how you're doing, as well as be contributing to this larger conversation that we're having nationally about what kind of support we need at federal and state levels. As well as we're publishing TRG, a monthly insights report based on this data that uh, provides insights from our perspective, interpreting all of this data that we're sitting on to help guide your thinking and focus both organizations and the field on the most important trends. So I'll say at a 15th time, the benchmark is free to join thanks to support from the NEA and thanks to our partnership with SMU Data Arts. And setup is seriously very quick and easy to get yourself uh, up on a daily feed that uh, that feeds into this benchmark. So just head to trgarts.com slash benchmark. You'll find that link in the chat uh, to learn more and to get signed up. Uh, and then my last update here and final slide is got the most importance and relevance to members of the audience insight management program for AIM. Uh, earlier in the fall, we announced a formal alliance with our friends at Purple7. Uh, for years, they have been offering top tier data management and analysis tools and data insights in the UK. And so we're now partnering with them to bring those insights and services across the pond to our North American data center clients, which includes the members of the AIM program. Uh, so what that means for members of the audience insight manager is that in the eventual, you'll be uh, receiving uh, a rollout of new analytics insights that's gonna transform your raw data that you submit to the AIM program into actionable business intelligence and even more advanced campaign management tools than are already available. Uh, as anybody who, I don't know if any of you have worked on a software project, but there are lots of moving parts and lots of details for us still to work through with our friends at Purple7. So I don't have any hard dates or anything like that for you now. But know that as members of the AIM program, you'll be some of the first to get your hands on these really, really awesome new insights and analytics when they first become available. So that's something to keep your eye out for uh, and is an added benefit of membership in the program. Um, and members who are already part of the program will be the first to receive updates when they become available uh, as we roll some of these new tools out. So that's what I've got in terms of announcements of, and news and resources from us here at TRG Arts. I'm going to hand it over to my really awesome and brilliant colleague, Hannah, so that she can do a quick tour of how Data Center and the AIM program can help you even during this pandemic. So Hannah, I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. I want to first draw everyone's attention to me and Adam's photos that were so clearly taken before the pandemic. Both our hair. Before I stopped getting haircuts, yeah. I know. <laughs> Thanks for that. Last haircut was in March. <laughs> everybody yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um anyways thanks T at trg you guys really are are our priority new jersey in particular we've had such a special relationship with all of you over the years so you're a special community network to us and so thanks guys for showing up for this today what i want to lean in on in data center which AIM is powered by our software tool called Data Center, is two things today. We're gonna look at how Data Center can help fuel your development campaigns. So we're gonna look at how to model your current donors and your favorite patrons, and then how to apply that model to current patrons who might be your subscribers or frequent multi-buyers. Then we're gonna shift gears and look at how to use data center to help fuel diversity for you guys. 
So that's going to start with giving you an organization baseline and a community baseline. And we'll look at a couple different ways to use data center to help track your progress on um, building that diversity in your audiences and how to make sure that you're able to track that over time. So without further ado, I'm going to jump into data center right here. I'm going to share my screen. So hopefully nothing crazy happens. Here we go. And we're off. Okay, I'm just going to assume that you guys can all see this. And um, if you can't, then put something in the chat. So this is data center. For those of you who are not familiar, um, our dashboard gives us some insights here. And if you are more interested in getting a demo on how all of data center works, then I encourage you to reach out to us at uh, Let's Talk at trgarts.com. But for today, we're going to look at a little bit more um, inter intermediate advanced functionality. So we're going to go into our campaigns. And what I want to focus on here is the first thing we are going to do is look at our donors, our current donors, see where they are, see how they behave. So to do that, we're gonna go ahead and go into my campaign called Development Research. Under each campaign, you can have as many research lists or mailing lists as you want. Today, I have went ahead and prepared an annual fund research right here called November, 2021. And what I am gonna do with this is you can see in this list, I have my 2020 donors to the annual fund, my 2019 donors to the annual fund, and my 2018 donors to the annual fund. What I wanna know is I wanna know who these people are. What are their demographics? What is setting my annual fund donors apart from my single ticket buyers. There must be some behavior there that I can find useful. So I'm gonna go ahead and run one of our many reports in data center. We have over 20 different business intelligence reports that can help fuel you. But right now we're gonna run our list demographics report. And I've already exported this into Excel today so that we can take a quick look at it. Let's see, I'm gonna, Hope that you guys can see this well enough. But this report is just telling us that we have, of my 232 donors that I'm looking at, I have a demographic match rate for all of them. And in demographic research, that's not common, but I'm in a test account, so I get to do whatever I want to do. On this second sheet here, we are going to get some quick ins visual insights on some key demographic attributes of these donors. So I can see an education breakdown of them. That is usually something that is trending with donors. They tend to be highly educated. I can see their marital status, presence of children in the home, their race breakdown, generation, income, child age, and some other age breakouts. While these visuals are great for presenting to a board or to a team, we can go into the third sheet here and get far more granular. On this third sheet, you can see over 200 different demographic attributes of my donors. It goes from standard demographics you would expect to see, like age, age in increments, the month and years they were born, generation, and as we go down, we start to get into more psychographic attributes. We can see political affiliations. We can see the way they tend to purchase, whether they're interested in sci-fi, if they're career-minded or investment-minded. All of these attributes are fueled by our demographic partner, Axiom, which is a demographic leader. We can go all the way down to the bottom, which is my favorite attributes, which shows the first and second vehicle make and model in the home of your donors. And believe it or not, there can actually be some trends here. So when you have this information, what I would encourage you guys to do when you pull these demographic reports is to make sure that you're saving it to a place on your computers or servers that you guys can refer back to it in the future. So right now I've got this awesome um, demographic information on my past donors 
And I'm going to use it and apply it to some of my current patrons to potentially, let's see here. Hold on here. Are you guys able to see this monitor here? Let me see here. I don't know if anyone is seeing this. What, what we're seeing right now is just a web browser, I think, Hannah. Oh gosh, okay, yep. Let me show you this then. Let me share into this. I just realized that. I'm just gonna share my whole screen so we can flip between sheets and stuff here. But um, all this report can be viewed in the web browser, but it's a little bit more functional in um, Excel. But so we can look here, here's our sheet with those report, with those demographic attributes. Here is our sheet that has over the, the over 200 different demographic attributes. And what's really interesting here when you compare it to other patrons that you might have is you'll really start to see consistent changes and consistent differences in your donors versus maybe your one-time single ticket buyers. But what we want to do is we want to decide some of these attributes that we think are actually making our donors different than our other patrons. So for today's um, purposes, we are just going to pretend like the only thing that makes our donors unique is their generation and their income. We know that is not true, but for time today, that's what we're going to um, move forward with. So those were all of our donors all of our previous donors, but we wanna see um, about reaching out to some potential donors. So in this list, I have my subscribers that I'm gonna hopefully shift to become donors. And what I've included in this list is I'm suppressing, I'm removing all of my current year donors because I already have them, I don't need to reach out to them. What I do want is I wanna include my past few year or my past couple of years of subscribers and my 2019 and 2018 donors because they've donated to me in the past, but since my current year donors are being suppressed, I'm gonna be able to reach out to the, all of my lapsed donors for the last couple of years. So now that I have all of those people in here, I'm gonna start applying some of those demographic attributes that we decided are important um, makeup of our current donors. So I'm gonna go into my demographics filtering here and I'm gonna add a filter. Any of those 200 plus demographic attributes we just saw in that sheet can be applied as a filter to any of your patrons. You can apply and research this as much as you want and the only time a cost is, is associated with a demographic filter is when we actually reach out to contact those patrons, when we want the mailing or email or phone list of them. So we're gonna go ahead and add a generation attribute. And I'm going to select values. I'm gonna just take people who were born in Gen X to the greatest generation. We're gonna take all of those guys here. And I'm also going to add an income filter. One thing that has been interesting and why I encourage all of you guys to be pulling some of this information is when you see how this information changes over time because of COVID. So what I'm gonna go into here is income and what I've been seeing in some of our, um, with some of our patrons has been that we actually have a spike in donors who are making 50,000. Then there's a little bit of a skip and it comes all the way up to 250 plus thousand. So I'm gonna save these attributes and see where our net count falls. Now, sometimes this net count drops really, really low. Again, I'm in a fake account, but you can mess around with these attributes until you get a number that is functional for you. 414 is great. Now I know that I have subscribers who fit the model of my current donors pretty well. And so this would maybe make a great email or phone campaign right now, maybe a mailing if you guys are doing mailings right now, but we can change this as much as we want. And the more that you use the tool, the more you'll learn how to fine tune it for yourselves. Now we're gonna shift gears and we're gonna look at how to do use data center to help fuel some diversity goals. 
What we're first going to do is we're going to come over into our reports module here. This is where those 20 different business intelligence reports live. And I'm going to pull a community demographic report. I've already pulled this report, so we can just go ahead and take a quick peek at it. What we're seeing here is we are seeing my fake Pikes Peak Orchestra account matched up against the demographics of my community network, my test network. You can see here that my, gener my generation differences here, I'm doing really well in millennials versus um, the way my community is performing. You can see here in the race that I am um, not as diverse as in some ways as my community network, but um, I'm succeeding in other ways. This is important to pull um, at the end of each production or the end of each season, because as data center updates your information, that stuff will change. It is dynamic, it's not static. So you're gonna wanna pull these demographic um, reports and save them to your server as you go through. If you wanna have the most accurate benchmark here. So I have right here in my hands a benchmark for my organization's demographic attributes versus my community's demographic attributes as of November 20th. But if I want to get a little more granular, if I wanna see how I'm progressing over time, um, one way is to save these files and keep doing it consistently over time so you can see them. But I can also look at some updated information and have built a diversity research campaign. In this campaign, I have two research lists. I have subscriber diversity from 2017 to 2018 and a subscriber diversity from 2019 to 2020. What I'm going to do is, or what I have done here is I've included all of my 2020 and 2019 subscribers in this list here. And I went ahead and pulled another demographic report. What I want you to see though, is when I pulled this demographic report, it lets you put some parameters around it. What I chose to do is to look at this subscriber diversity from 19 to 20 list compared to my subscriber diversity 2017 to 18 list, because I wanna visually see where the progress of my patrons is, how the progress of my organization's diversity has been over these two subscription seasons. So I'm gonna go ahead and look at this. I've already pulled it. And what you can see here, I've got my subscriber 2019 to 20 list over here on the left, my 2017 to 18 over here on the right. And what you can see is the gradual changes in diversity here. So um, my education has changed a little bit. It's morphed over time. The presence of children is changing. Maybe that's because of some programming that I have changed. My race and ethnicity breakout has also changed and um, definitely for the better. So you can see in 2017 to 18, I had more of just a white audience and in 2019 to 2020, it has shifted a little bit. Maybe that's because I've changed programming or changed who I've been reaching out to, um, but this is a great way to see over years and over time, the differences in demographics. And maybe that's also gonna shift on programs. So you could have, compare a list of all of your pops shows compared to maybe some new works and see how the diversity breakout is there. This is something that you guys really need to be paying attention to right now. I know everybody is saying it, but if you have a plan for um, really tracking your audience diversity, if you do not have a way to visualize this and make sure that it's data backed with actual numbers and real data, then you are really gonna struggle to have authentic diversity and struggle to grow um, your audiences over time. Let's see here. Okay, so um, those are some of our tools right now for developing your donors, developing and researching your audience diversity. 
there are so many other cool things in this world that I would love to show you regarding how to use data center for diversity and development, but alas, we do not have time. So I hope that you guys are in our community network in New Jersey. And if you're not, we would love to have you to work on this together. We do have some new tools that we are wanting to invest in for you guys in AIM and we're trying to develop for you guys, but we're not sure if you guys would be interested in it. So here's our pitch for no additional, not a lot of work. We can just kind of turn this around for you guys. Would you see increased value in your New Jersey network to have sub networks based on South Jersey? and central and north or whatever breakout would be most valuable to you. So those would be like little sub networks. It would not limit the way that you can research um, your community at large. You could still compare your organization to everyone in New Jersey, but you could also more easily use trading, do trading list and do trading research with some of your more regionally specific organizations. Um, again, it wouldn't limit any of your research. It would just make some of your list trading and some of your research more regionally based and might simplify things for you. The keyword is might. We don't know if this is something that you guys would be interested in, if this would add value for you. So if you could put in the poll here, if you think those regionally specific sub networks would be something that's valuable to you, we would so appreciate it. Awesome. Okay, great. Absolutely. Well, that's all me and Adam have for you guys right now. Do you guys have any questions? So there are some questions, Hannah, um, and that poll did pop up. So we'll let people fill that out. Um, and uh, all right. So in no particular order here, mostly because I have trouble scrolling with this computer that I use the Q&A. Um, Jonathan Spinner asks, how do you derive the demographic material? Is this material we have placed in the software or does TRG provide this information with the help of a research firm? Yeah, we get our all of our demographic attributes from our partner Axiom. They get it from um, purchase behavior, credit card behavior, online, some online behavior. Um, and then what we do is we take that every six weeks, we get a fully updated um, demographic set and we import that into um, data center. So every six weeks, all of the demographic data is completely updated. So that's, way, that's kind of the best way to see those trends is if you're pulling those reports like every month or six weeks, that's where you'll see like incomes shifting, career shifting, things like that. Does that answer your question? Yeah, and I know there was another question that was similar to, to that that came up in the chat too about how often it gets refreshed, especially given the pandemic and people's changing financial situations. So the connection to Axiom and the refreshing that, 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 that happens there is, is certainly helpful. Um, so here's another question came from an anonymous attendee. How can we use this information to segment email lists? We are not really doing direct mail right now. Yeah, so first thing I would say is make sure you're retaining your patrons' email addresses. <laughs> we do offer a service where we try to append emails to patrons who you don't have emails for, but it's not incredibly um, successful return rate on that. So make sure you have your patrons' emails. Um, second to that, we do all of that research that we just did, we're actually on email campaigns. So data center was taking all of my patrons that fit the criteria we had, it was deduplicating them based on email address. So I could have pulled that all into an email campaign. For what it's worth, our pride launched its annual appeal yesterday, utilizing AIM to segment our email list so we could be targeted about how we set our annual appeal. So uh, it works when you put it into to action. Um, we, we're uh, an example of that. Uh, Jim, this next question is actually, I think for you and not to confuse audience insight management with some of the other services that we do, um, but it's a good question. Is there a list of media outlets in New Jersey to whom we could submit events that's available to Art Pride members? Sure, actually um, there is. You can, can you hear me? 
great. Yeah, actually there is. Um, it's a totally different program. It's called the Community Media Database or CMD because we have an acronym for everything. Um, so we, whoever had that, if you want to just reach out to me offline, uh, you can reach me at jatkinson at artprideandj.org. I'd be happy to kind of get you some information about how that program works. Uh, but so the short answer is yes, we do. Uh, it's just not directly tied to, to this audience program. Uh, and I think it's worth mentioning, Hannah, if I could just bring up that it, that Axiom pulls data from a lot of resources, right? It's not just credit card behavior. It's it's pretty broad. If you could just touch on a little bit of just about how extensive that that is. Yeah. Um, and if, if you guys work with us, we're also happy to share some more information with Axiom. Or if you're interested in that offline, we have more robust information we can send out. Um, it is incredibly extensive. So um, some of the standard most reliable demographic attributes are from census data. Um, but really a, a broad amount of it is from credit cards because that's when people are giving a lot of their information out. And also we are able to, it, it, we're able to see how they purchase and what some of their purchase behavior is. And then Axiom has some really robust analytics they do that will say based on purchase behavior, that means that a person is a likely investor. And those can be really good people to pull out for um, donation campaigns. And you might actually see that um, your donors, when you pull this demographic research, that your donors are probably um, have a high percentage of them that are um, heavy investors. So those are some, some of the ways, but it's very robust. Yeah, it's basically like your digital footprint in the universe, in essence, yeah. is what this is, right? And it's really how large corporations market to, to their patrons. If you ever wonder, why did I get this thing in the mail? How did they know? But this is kind of how they know. Yeah. Jim, um, the looks like the next question is actually, we might have jumped the gun. I don't know if you want to go down to the next slide. Where that, that slide there right before the questions and answers. Actually, we're asking oh. Vince. Yep, uh, got it. <laughs> so someone wanted to know what sort of costs will organizations bear <laughs> to be part of this program? Jonathan Spinner with the, the segue question for you, Jim. Go for it. Well done. Uh, perfect segue. So yes, yeah, so uh, the subscription window for AIM uh, just opens, I think yesterday. Uh, so if you're an existing subscriber, um, as you know, it's an auto renewal, so you don't have to do anything. You don't have to renew. You don't have to update any data. Um, you just kind of keep using AIM, and um, you will, you know, you'll be billed on at about February one, which is the start of the year. Um, the, you, you can opt out as long as you opt out by December thirty one. That's the unsubscribe deadline. Uh, if you're new and want to get engaged in AIM, um, you can just go to ourprideandj.org/aim, and uh, you can learn more about it, and you can subscribe right there. So there's a, there's a link right there. We can click on subscribe uh, this year because we're fully aware of, of the impact that COVID has had. Um, basically we've cut all the annual subscription rates in half. So it's based on organizational budget size. So there's not a one price frame. It's like depending on how large your organization is, there's a sliding scale. Um, so the price range would aim from $125 up to the, the largest, would be $600. So uh, that's the range. I and mean, again, you can see the, the breakdown right on the website about how much it would cost your organization to subscribe to this for the year. Uh, but they're, they're, they're the rates. Yeah. And they're, again, they're half off what uh, they typically would be in a given year. Uh, in addition, we're working with the New Jersey Theater Alliance. So they're um, helping us by offering an additional 15% off of even these rates, if you're a New Jersey Theater Alliance member. So there'd be like yet another 15% discount. Um, and then if you're an existing subscriber, that just automatically gets deducted. And if you're new, there's a promo code that the Theater Alliance has that you can plug into the form that would take an, yet another additional 15% off of that. So these are, um, you know, fortunately we can make it available completely for free because there are uh, costs, but we've been working with the Arts Council who are our partners and uh, working internally. And, and we're fully aware that, you know, we can take a hit um, by wanting to make sure that uh, that this is available as inexpensively as humanly possible for the calendar year 2021. Yeah, I mean, clearly the Arts Council, uh, Allison Travner and their team understand what everybody's going through. And so we appreciate them being flexible as we try and make this as affordable and accessible for everyone. Um, and to our partners, 
uh, at the Theater Alliance, the John McEwen and his team, who uh, the reason they get the discount is because the Theater Alliance subsidizes uh, that that uh, that discount uh, directly. And so we we appreciate our partners. We're all trying to do our part uh, to make make it easier for people to access the information they need, organizations to access the information they need. Um, so Hannah and Adam, those are all the questions I have for you. There is one question here who I'm going to bring back uh, Anne Marie for, but Hannah and Adam, thank you very, very much uh, for the presentation. I know you are both available. Should we, uh, sort of any of our partners have more, more detailed questions down the road? Thanks so much. Thank you, Adam. Uh, all right, so Anne Marie, I think you saw this, but I'm going to read it out loud for everybody. I have a question. Uh, this is Meredith Burns who says, I have a question about CDBG funding. Americans for the Arts advocated for CARES Act funding to go to CDBG departments and municipalities for arts groups. The issue is that CDBG funding has strict federal guidelines to serve low and middle income people. It's a catch 22 for arts organizations that either don't have this demographic info, don't serve these communities directly, or have been out of operation due to COVID-19 and cannot serve these groups. How do we access this funding support? What was the American for the Arts intent behind increasing the CDBG budgets by millions of dollars per municipality? per municipality. Does this money expire if not used by the end of the year? So Amber, we're hoping you can shed a little light on that. Well, um, a little bit of light. Um, so the first order of business, I think, would be to get in touch with your county economic development person. So for Hudson County, where Meredith is, it would be Michelle Richardson. Um, and she's really savvy about the arts, so she can provide some real um, strong advice. Um, the next thing is to participate in AIM to be able to get your demographic information on your audiences, because that will, you know, give you some insight as to how, um, you know, who you're serving and where they are. Um, and then um, um, the deadline on CARES funding is, is kind of, everybody's saying December 30th that the money has to be spent. And what that actually means is going back, it goes back to when um, the emergency declaration was signed in March, all the way through December 30th, those expenses um, can be used to spend the money. The reporting is not gonna happen until probably January or later. Um, and then on top of all that, you'll probably be seeing an action alert uh, within the next couple of days because um, during lame duck session, we're hoping for the federal stimulus, uh, the second federal stimulus package to happen. But in the meantime, we also are going to encourage our senators to extend this CARES deadline past December 30th. So um, uh, first line of business, your economic development person. Um, why did C CDBG money comes through the county? So it's very localized. And um, that's the reason um, you have more uh, flexibility to use that funding. It's not easy, it's tricky. There's a lot of data that you do have to have on hand. AIM can help with part of that. And um, I'll, you know, Meredith can shoot me an email um, later and maybe a future webinar might be bringing some of our economic development people in here to talk about CDBG funding and how to, how to access that. Thanks, Amory. And Jim, one last question that came up here, um, and I'm hoping you might be able to provide some clarity. Um, just in terms of when people submit the events at jerseyarts.com, in the past, we had this full all events calendar, but now that the current newer version, uh, we'll call it like 1.5, as we're getting ready for the new uh, Jersey Arts website uh, in the future, um, the events on jerseyarts.com are curated they're not really the true full robust listing. So can you just shed a little bit of light onto when folks submit their events, how that curation, how that editing editorial work is going? Sure, yeah, thank you. It's a great question. So yes, you're correct, Adam's right on. So the old website just had a, you, you had an account, you submitted an event, an event appeared on the site. It was kind of an automated system. Um, what we have now is it's really, as Adam labeled it exactly right, it, it's a curated system. So you're submitting your events, um, we have uh, Emily Ambash on our team, who's our web content manager. We have Corey Reif, who's our marketing communications person. Uh, they kind of look at these together and, uh, and curate the content. So they're, they're constantly mixing it up and changing it around, uh, but it's, it's not a, you know, a, a listing of everything that's going on. It's a curated listing of what's happening. 
so that they're trying to uh, one, make it as digestible for the consumer as they can, because uh, nobody wants to look at a list of 700 events. Uh, and two, making sure that it moves around so that the same groups aren't always highlighted. It's not the same type of events that are always highlighted. So you have to think of it more in terms of um, like, I'm submitting this event to this publication for them to consider to be featured versus I'm filling out a form, which automatically means that event's going to pop up. So, and I think the other part of this is that's important too, is that, you know, this is a, this is a conversation. So Corey, Emily, Jim, <clears throat> for what it's worth, the entire ARPRI team are, you know, completely accessible. So if for some reason you've submitted events, it hasn't popped up, you know, I encourage you to, to go beyond the submission event and reach out to us to have a conversation about, you know, maybe why something was highlighted. I think it's also important to make sure your events in there, submitting those events, that's the same place that Corey, Emily, and the team are looking to pull information about when we're creating our own content, our own culture versus content, the podcast, the video segments, the feature stories. So it's important to be there. It's important to be at the, the Jersey Arts Marketers meetings. And it continues to be hopefully important to all of you to be here today. So I know we went over a little bit. Um, usually we're at 45 minutes and we promised an hour today and we're, we're just past that. Um, so there are no more further questions and answers. I want to thank Jim and Amory, uh, Adam and Hannah for coming in. And uh, you didn't get a chance to see them. Vince Hall behind the scenes who's been advancing the slides and making sure all the technology is working as well as there he is. Hey Vince. <laughs> and as well as the entire Art Pride team that are on the call today and are working to make sure you're informed about this and, uh, and that we're gonna get up on the website uh, later today. So thank you. Our next webinar is Friday, December 4th. Uh, we appreciate it. Um, we hope uh, everyone stays well um, and be safe out there and we will talk to you soon. Take care.